the NFL's conference call that was held last night included a very clear and plain statement from the league. And this is the absolute right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. There is no consideration of what happens with the remainder of last night's game. That's what Jeff Miller, the executive VP of communications, said. There's nothing in consideration right now. Our concern is for the player and his well-being at the appropriate time. I'm sure we'll have a conversation around the next steps regarding the game. The game does not matter. And that's one thing that I think was very reassuring and comforting to anyone paying attention to it. Immediately, the concern pivoted to the player on behalf of everyone that I saw last night, listened to last night, every message from the league, every indication is, despite the stakes of the game, those stakes are trivial in comparison to making sure that DeMar Hamlin is okay. All the other stuff will figure itself out. There are plenty of smart people who will come up with a fair and acceptable solution to this problem. But, you know, people thought initially, Peter, well, they'll just take up the game tomorrow night or they'll take it up Wednesday. The, the Bills went back to Buffalo. Some initially were going to stay with DeMar Ham Hamlin by 2 a.m. or so. It was clear that the Bills are returning to Orchard Park, New York. There's not going to be a game anytime soon. The focus for now will be and will continue to be DeMar Hamlin, the rest of the league has stopped. There's nothing else to do for any of us who care about football and care about the men who play the game than to wait for further word on the status of DeMar Hamlin. That's what we're committed to doing, and I think that's what the vast majority of football fans and media will be doing in the coming hours, days, however long it takes to find out what the status is of DeMar Hamlin as we all hope and pray for the absolute best for this 24-year-old man. Younger than our children, Peter, and that shouldn't. I mean, it's just one of those things that for us, you know, we've been covering the game a long time as our children grow up, and I'm sure you went through this too. You start realizing the, the, these people that we cover are younger than our children, and th that adds another layer to it to anyone out there who has kids, especially if they have children who are older than a 24-year-old young man who is dealing with something that that none of us had on our radar screen going into last night's game. Well, I think one of the powerful things that I started to realize last night uh, when reading a lot about DeMar Hamlin and understanding the goodness of him and uh, the, the love that is in his heart, particularly for his native Pittsburgh, you, you know, you just realize that when you watch the game and anybody goes down, it could be anybody. It could be any one of the players who is dressed for that football game on a given night, a given day. And that's why you saw all the emotion, because every one of those players understands that could be him. And Mike, one other thought occurred to me watching this last night. I've been covering the NFL for 39 years and I've never seen the level of concern on players' faces after an injury or an on-field incident that I saw last night. Because usually what happens in the NFL, the NFL has uh, serial next man up syndrome. <laughs> That's how players are basically conditioned to play. You learn it, especially if you're in, say, a big time college football program, or certainly in the NFL. If an injury happens during training camp, if an injury happens, uh, you know, on the field during the week of practice for an NFL team, what happens is the trainers and the medical people go tend to the player who has a knee or shoulder or some injury that he has, and they tend to him. And all the coach does is simply move the practice a few yards away so that they won't be disrupted by the injured player. I'll never forget at the Super Bowl um, that actually that uh, Chris's dad, Phil, played against uh, his Giants were in the Super Bowl in January of 1991 in Tampa against the Buffalo Bills. And Phil Sims was injured that year and wasn't going to play in the game. Jeff Hostetler played. And I remember going out to dinner that year week with with Phil and he really didn't have all that much to do because Bill Parcells's practice uh on injured players was that 
they were not going to be heavily involved in the preparation for the game. So the players could basically be off doing different things. And it just has occurred to me over the years that when you get injured in the NFL, you it's not that you're a non-person. It's just you can't help us. And so we don't really need you right now. So, you know, go over there and the players who are going to play, we will get prepared with them. And that's why this was so totally different. It was different because you have 89 other players on the field from both teams looking at that and saying, this is not a torn ACL. This is not a cracked rib. This is someone whose life is in danger right now on the field. And so I think that really hit me about the scene last night, that this game was not going to go on. And, and, and they were going to bring this player, DeMar Hamlin, to the hospital. And all of a sudden, it was nothing about DeMar Hamlin, the player. It was all about DeMar Hamlin, the person, saving his life and making sure that he can uh, hopefully recover from this and go on to live a normal life. We have the image of Josh Allen. The video of Josh Allen's reaction with his hands on his face was the chilling moment for me that this is not the standard precautionary measure that is taken if someone may have suffered a neck injury that we see once every three weeks thereabouts something like that happens and it's stopped and we're, we're being very careful as they should be it that's when it felt different the reactions from the players the reactions from the crowd that's when this is serious something very serious is happening and where does everyone go from here to understand the situation and, and how anyone can possibly move forward. There were some moments of confusion last night that will be sifted out and sorted out at some point in the future. They don't really matter to where things stand now. But last night on the conference call with Troy Vincent, Jeff Miller, and Donna Ponte, the question came up because there were a very limited number of questions that typically and primarily came from Bill's media and Bengal's media. During the broadcast, there was a suggestion at one point that the game would resume after a five-minute opportunity for the players to warm up. Troy Vincent said that he does not know where that came from. It never crossed our minds to talk about warming up to resume to play. There were ongoing and constant discussions between referee Sean Smith, the coaches, as to what to do. Troy Vincent said he was in constant communication with Commissioner Roger Goodell and NFL Players Association Executive Director DeMore Smith about what to do, how to proceed. The concern was DeMar Hamlin. The concern was the players, the coaches, anyone out there who would be called upon to continue the game if that was the decision that was going to be made. And it became obvious through the passage of time. And as we saw more and more about how serious the situation was and how traumatized everyone connected to it was, primarily and specifically the players and the coaches, that it was not the answer to continue. And, Peter, that is the, the, the push against what you were explaining, how players are injured all the time, the game keeps going. Whether you're injured during practice, whether you're injured during a game, that's the way it's always been. Everyone knows there's a risk of injury that will keep you from continuing in the game, so the game necessarily must continue without the player. And it took time for everyone to realize how serious the situation was and that there really only was one option to suspend the game, postpone the game, and if need be, cancel the game and not finish it. Again, those are decisions, as the league said, will be made at the appropriate time. For now, the only appropriate thing to do is to wait for further word on the status of DeMar Hamlin and hope and pray that he will indeed be fine. You know, Mike, uh, last night, when you're watching all this and when you're sifting through all the information, I noticed a GoFundMe page for DeMar Hamlin. He ran a toy drive uh, in his native McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania for Christmas. And his goal for this toy drive on the GoFundMe page was for $2,500. With that $2,500, he had hoped to 
buy some toys for underprivileged children where he came from. And I just refreshed the page, and as of this morning, there have been 127,000 donations to the toy drive. And the toy drive now stands at more than $3.2 million. And that isn't just Bills fans or sympathetic Bengals fans. That is from people all over planet Earth. And that is how much this has impacted and affected everyone. And I just kept thinking to myself, think how, when and if uh, DeMar Hamlin, who currently uh, lays apparently sedated in a Cincinnati hospital, think about what will happen when DeMar Hamlin finds that out. And I just kept thinking to myself, imagine how thrilled he will be at this horrendous turn of events that became something uh, incredibly positive at the same time. And obviously that is a byproduct, a sidebar. It's not nearly uh, as important as anything related to DeMar Hamlin's health. But I did think that you talked about everyone coming together at a time like this and Bills players, Bengals players coming together at a time like this. And I can think of nothing else that binds people you know, through the sport of football than an event that everybody can say, we need to show DeMar Hamlin that we really care about him. And I do think his GoFundMe page screams that we care about you, DeMar Hamlin. And, and it's a vehicle for people to do something slash anything to show that they care. The Bills fans started this dynamic several years ago with showing appreciation, showing respect, showing love and admiration by contributing to the causes important to the players. Remember, it was a playoff win by the Bengals over the Ravens yeah. that got the Bills in several years ago. And Andy Dalton, the Bengals quarterback at the time, his foundation was flooded with donations from Bills fans. Within the past two years, when Josh Allen's grandmother died, Bills fans and fans of all teams flooded the hospital in Buffalo, O'Shea Children's Hospital, with millions of dollars in donations. It's a way that, that people can show they care at a time of serious need where there's nothing that really can be done. We hear that all the time. We say that all the time. Let me know if there's anything I can do because people want to help even if there is nothing that can be done. In situations like this, people find something they can do. And it illustrates how many people care. It illustrates how many people are concerned, are worried, are praying for this young man. And this number is going to keep going up and up and up, Peter. As you said, it's over 3.2 million. It will keep going up and up because this is the one vehicle for people to, con to continue to show that they care about the men who play the game and specifically this young man, Damar Hamlin, as he continues to receive care and continues to be in critical condition at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Mike, you know, one other thing I just wanted to point out about, about the injury itself and about what happened during the game um, I think, you know, aside from two or three other or two or three uh, people whose first thought is, well, what is going to happen to the game? Is this going to be, is this game going to be restarted on Thursday? Is it just not going to be played? Is it, you know, the fact is that, you know, I think the vast majority of reaction to this is we just don't care figure it out. Someone will figure it out later in this week, maybe today. Who knows? I don't really care. Uh, well, what does it mean for, for home field in the AFC? I, I don't care. You know, the Bills and the Bengals are going to the playoffs. 
Kansas City's going to the playoffs. Where these games are played, stop. Just just stop. You know, and if this game doesn't get played, if the NFL just moves on this weekend with the current games and they just declare this game unplayed, no contest, I don't know, whatever word, it's unprecedented. I don't care. And so I think that seeing that the vast majority, the vast majority of reaction to this, both in the media and from the players, was we don't care about this game. We care about DeMar Hamlin. I think that is a very, very healthy response. And think of it, Mike. This, arguably, was the game of the year in the NFL. And it had started off like firecrackers, you know, with Joe Burrow taking the Bengals down the field uh, and throwing that beautiful first touchdown pass to Tyler Boyd. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, this was going to be a fabulous display of the sport's greatness. Uh, and in an instant, that was taken away. And I just have no interest in focusing on, eventually someone's going to have to focus on what becomes of this. Uh, but I'm glad that time wasn't last night or quite frankly this morning. Well, Peter, we're going to wrap this up and thank you very much for your time today. But I want to say one thing because I thought of you last night as, you know, in those helpless moments of just trying to put your brain into some positive use as you wait, as you're horrified, as you're concerned, as you're worried. And you think, well, they can't play this game. Well, how can they not play this game? How can they have less than a full season for the Bengals and the Bills? I thought of something that you reported during the first year of the pandemic, the NFL was fully prepared to accept the possibility that not every team will play its full slate of games. At the time, it was 16. And if we have to make decisions about playoff seating or home field or whatever based upon winning percentage instead of raw win-loss, so be it. So be it. That's what we have to do. Sometimes you just do what you have to do. It may not be perfect, but you just do it. And I think that's where... This should be pointing and will be pointing again. It's premature, but it shouldn't freak anyone out. There should be no one out of the 100% of media and fans who are following this. There should be 0.0% who are worried about that aspect of what will we do if they don't play this game. We will move on. That's what we'll do. And, and, and I thought of you in that report because the NFL was ready to accept that two years ago. The NFL should embrace it now is the right thing to do. And I, I, I think they will at the appropriate time. And the appropriate time will arrive at some point sooner rather than later, Peter. And, and look, I think last night the NFL did the wise thing in basically reiterating that, you know, we're not going to talk about the game now. And, you know, we'll talk about the game at the appropriate time. I'm not sure what an appropriate time is going to be, but it certainly was not... Um, in three or four hours after uh, a man lay on the field and you weren't sure whether he was going to live or not. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.